Welcome to Grid Live Wrap Up. My name is Joe San Diego. With me, we have Ben Schneider from Grid Encore and LastCar.info and Kobe Lambeth. A big thank you to our Patreon investors, Colin Deschel, Mark Robin, David, and Matthew. You two can invest into Grid Network each and every month. Get some Grid Network stickers sent out to you as a big thank you. And if you want to get a Grid Network sticker but do a one time investment, $10 or more through YouTube Super Chat or buy me a coffee. We'll get you there. Jason leads the leaderboard with two cups of coffee and one Super Chat. We encourage everyone to do that. And the simplest way to invest in us, hit the bell icon, subscribe to the Grid Network. And we encourage everyone in the chat room to participate in the chat room as we have a lot to talk about. Love answering questions and hearing your opinions online. And Ben, I got to say, we have to start off with, I think, what everybody is talking about. And that is the Am Better Health 400 at Landmore Speedway. Today's race, by the time we got to it, near the end, less than 10 cars were involved in a crash at a Landmore Speedway. We had a final shootout with less than 10 laps to go. And by 0.003 seconds, Daniel Suarez takes his first oval race win. And one of the big things we know it has to be said, he was ahead of Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch, second career win for him, first on the oval, and the first Mexican-born driver to win a Cup Series race on the oval. And he broke the piñata at the start-finish line and silenced the doubters for a while at least because we know in the past been on our 2024 prediction show, even roundtable, we talked about Suarez and the pressures to perform. He's been here for a while. He only had one win at Sonoma. Now he gets this win at Atlanta, where it was a race of survival. Suarez even had damage from that first crash in the day on lap two. So I got to ask you, how much does this win take off the pressure on Suarez for the remainder of the year? You know, Joe, it's an interesting question you asked, because originally my answer was going to be hardly at all. And that would not have been taken away from what Daniel Suarez did today. I think this is absolutely huge for his confidence and huge for his season to get a win, which he was lacking last year. Like you mentioned, Joe, he did have the win at Sonoma in 22, but no wins in 23. Now he starts off the season here in only the second race with a win in 2024. That's absolutely huge for him. Don't get me wrong, but it's about the situation at Trackhouse, which you guys were alluding to on the roundtable show and talking about how he has the pressure because you have Shane Van Gisbergen, who, by the way, finished third again in the Xfinity race. We'll talk about him a lot more on the Encore show tomorrow. Uh, and Zane Smith as well. Is he really just there as a placeholder keeping the seat warm because are there going to be enough seats or spaces of a track house in, if you will, for all of those drivers who would be the odd driver out. Ross Chastain has been a championship four contender, won a couple of races himself. You'd have to think he's probably safe. Suarez would seem to be the odd guy out there. But then I saw the tweet that our friend Alex uh, put in our group chat and Justin Marks talking about uh, those rumors and kind of putting them to rest, at least for right now, about Daniel Suarez and saying that he doesn't envision him driving anywhere other than track house, at least any time in the near future here. And I started to think along the lines of what Alex followed up with, you know, maybe that means Shane Van Gisbergen might have a better long-term future set up at colleague racing. And that may be, you know, obviously he's racing for them in Xfinity right now. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what his cup future plans have down the road. Maybe track house could run four cars. I don't know. I, I wouldn't put anything past Justin Marks with what he's built over there, that organization, just a couple of short years here. Um, but I think when, when you look at what Daniel Suarez did today, and then you see those comments from his owner, in the post-race press conference, I do think that it certainly has to lift a lot of pressure off his shoulders, especially to get a win this early in the year. It's going to be absolutely huge for his season going forward. Has to feel good to get the win going forward. The one thing I kept wondering about, this is essentially a super speedway win in reality, where with Daytona, Talladega, Atlanta, the draft in, he led nine laps today. It wasn't like he went out there and was dominant or positioned himself for the win until the very end. So overall, I feel like I've been wondering for Suarez, I think this is going to be a big confidence boost as in, you know, you could win. You could go out there, be a little bit more aggressive and get the wins on the ovals. But that said, though, I think there's going to be more expectations. Okay, you won on a super speedway. You won on a road course. Now can you do it on a real mile and a half oval? Not a Atlanta Motor Speedway, which acts like a super speedway, but Las Vegas, Kansas, Charlotte. Can you be up there contending? Because 
we've seen in the past he gets one win that was it last year no wins i mean really when you look at his numbers as well too before track house and after joining track house this is where he's gained more success i think for darren suarez it's going to be really interesting to see how he does i think he, this will boost his confidence i think he would probably feel a little less pressure like you said especially with what justin mark said he probably knows more what's going on behind the scenes but I think still Dan Suarez wants to go out there, perform, and prove he belongs in the Cup Series and overall with Trackhouse Racing. Now, a couple of comments in the chat room. Adam, one of the greatest finishes in NASCAR history and the Gen 3 era. We have awesome finish. Be sure to subscribe. You're brand new. And Suarez joins Mario Ray and Earl Russell for the international drivers to win in an oval like I said, Ben, first Mexican-born driver to win Oval Suarez. He now joins William Byron as the two drivers who have clinched playoff spots so far this year. And what's really interesting is both of them are in Chevrolets. I think a lot of folks anticipated Ford to be in victory lane. Hendricks, we all anticipate Hendricks is going to be a race-winning team. They got that. Trackhouse, especially what happened last year, looks like maybe things are starting to turn better because Chastain, he won at Phoenix. Then we had the offseason, had a good Daytona 500 going until the last crash coming to the white flag. Today, Chastain, he was up front, but it was his teammate down for us getting the win. Do you think Trackhouse is closing up on Hendricks when it comes to Chevrolet teams, or is Hendricks still comfortably the number one team when it comes to the Chevrolet camps? Well, first of all, thank you, Adam, for bringing up that stat. I, I saw Seth Egger tweet it out. Uh, as well, although of course Mario Andretti raced under the American flag, he uh, was was born uh, over in Italy. So uh, you, you've got him, and then you have Earl Ross, the Canadian, obviously as well. So the third driver to win on an oval uh, in NASCAR Cup competition. Obviously, we had you know Montoya and Ambrose win on road courses. Montoya came very close to winning on an oval at IMS uh, several years ago before speeding penalty ruined that. Um, but but a, a great stat there nonetheless, and great again for Daniel Suarez and, and for Trackhouse Racing. Does this put them above Hendrick though? Well, Hendrick just had a one-two finish from the Daytona 500 and has decades upon decades of history to go back on uh, themselves here. Trackhouse is still relatively new to the uh, to this side of the Cup Series garage here, winning uh, several races and trying to be considered a top team here. So uh, I don't know that they've necessarily – I mean, they're certainly closer, faster than I ever thought they would be. But I think right now, Hendrick, and, and you could maybe even make an argument for Childress in the season that Kyle Busch is just coming off of. And, I mean, if it had just been a matter of one one-hundredth of a second, we could be talking about – uh, Kyle Busch in this position here after that race. I mean, he had another strong run today as well. Uh, you know, I think when you when you talk about the Chevrolet pecking order here, I think Trackhouse is more comparable to RCR right now competing for that number two spot uh, behind Hendrick Motorsports, who are still solidly number one. But uh, again, you know, that take nothing away from what Trackhouse has built so quickly. And uh, not just with Ross Chastain, not just with Project 91, but Daniel Suarez now, I think, solidly and firmly, especially after hearing what Justin Marks had to say in his press conference a, a long-term part of Trackhouse's future and what they're building over there in that organization. One of the things you mentioned was Rich Childress racing, especially Austin Dillon. He is not exactly having the greatest start to the season. What happened on the Daytona 500, he got caught up. Well, essentially, he sort of was involved, one of the main instigators of that lap two crash. Kyle Busch, he's been carrying the team. Starting to feel like, yes, you say, Trackhouse could easily, especially if Ross Chastain gets a win as far as those two in the playoffs. Kyle Busch, if he's the only one in the playoffs, that pecking order may seem to be a reversal when it comes to Trackhouse being the number two Chevrolet team. It's going to be really interesting. Now, as I mentioned, with Austin Dillon, he was involved in that 16 car crash on lap two when Todd Gillian checked up and stacked up that outside lane. Austin Dillon lost control, nowhere to go. 16 cars getting in a mess, entering turn one, including Dan Suarez. He had very little dash kept going, but some other drivers, they were done for the day. We saw five Toyotas in that crash, including both 2311 cars. Tyler Reddick really never recovered, but Bubba Wallace did. Christopher Bell, he was joined shortly later. Ty Gibbs, he managed to keep running. Eric Jones from Legacy Motor Club, does not a factor at all. And Alex Bowman, coming off that second place finish of the Daytona 500, given Hendrick that 1 2, not going to have any shot at the win. Do you blame Todd Gillian for the incident? And was it too early? To help a teammate, mainly Michael McDowell, try to get back in lane when we're just starting the second lap. 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's tough for me to blame Ty Gilliland for anything today. I mean, he ran a great race and, uh, you know, was up front for most of the day and uh, I think deserves uh, a ton of credit for that. Front Row Motorsports, generally speaking, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the new uh, Penske and Ford alliance that, they, that they've got now uh, or, or if it's just, you know, continuing to build off of what they have have improved with, with Michael McDowell the last several years. Maybe it's a combination of both. I think it has to be when you look at how well uh, both of their cars ran today. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, again, you know, one of the things that you – risk doing when you reconfigure a mile and a half to race like a Daytona Talladega style super speedway is, you know, all it takes is one slightly misjudged or mistimed move in, in the one hole that's just not quite big enough. And it creates a stack up that results in something like this. So, you know, the start of the race, everybody's bunched up two by two all the way back and, you know, trying to get in line, you know, teammates trying to uh, help each other out and help get a push or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's easy to forget, you know, just how young Todd Gilliland is, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, maybe a more experienced driver would have done something different in that situation, but I, I, I don't know. I don't chalk that up to, you know, anything that you can, you know, go, go after Todd Gilliland for ruining the days of 10 other drivers or anything like that. I think it was just an unfortunate situation in the wrong place in the wrong time. I'm sure some of the drivers whose days were compromised would probably disagree with that. But, um, you know, I think ultimately it's just a product of, you know, what, what happens when you try to put Daytona Talladega style racing into a track that's a mile shorter in length. And that's what we saw at the start of today's race. Todd Gillian, I know he wanted to help his teammate out, get back in line. I just felt like we're only starting the second lap. I feel the drivers, this is the stage of the race where they will be minding, understand that we got a long ways to go. Here comes Michael McDowell. We know he has a fast car. He'll get in line. I don't think he was going to get shuffled all the way back. I feel like a little bit of a mistake, but I wouldn't completely fault him as like a rookie error or just an absolutely uncalled for move. I just think it was just one of those deals. Once they start stacking up behind him, that ruined everyone's day. For, and overall, like you said, Ben, towards the race, as the race kept progressing on, he led the most laps. He was really looking very strong out there. I thought he was going to get the upset win. And we'll be talking about him and front row. They have to be feeling really good considering they got that Penske partnership, which was announced right before the Daytona 500. Stage one, a bit chaotic. Stage two, though, much cleaner and pretty much caution-free during green flag pit stops, despite Michael McDowell, who was running up towards the front, locking up the rear brakes, spun, hit William Byron. Those two hit the inside wall. They kept going, so we kept green until the end of the stage where that's where we saw essentially Joey Logano, couple others get involved and overall i gotta ask you this question because i feel like the green flag pit stops are really great we're seeing the field get spread out but again similar to daytona tires only i started wondering because everyone's racing towards the end of stage do you think maybe super speedways and atlanta could benefit if we remove the stage cautions First of all, I, can, I apologize if you can hear the radiator in the background. I think they just kicked the heat on in my apartment. So apologies if that background noise is coming in at all. But uh, Joe, you know where I stand. I think everybody watching who's a regular viewer knows where I stand. My uh, preferred rule change would be to not only get rid of the stage cautions, but to get rid of the stages entirely at every track we go to. Um, but I think what we tried last year at the road courses worked very well. I think you know we saw some great uninterrupted racing that improved strategy a little bit. Uh, but for some reason, the powers that be disagreed and they were back before the end of the year, even in a playoff race at the Charlotte Roval. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's probably indicative of the direction that we're going to be going here over the next several years. I don't see them going away anytime soon. But um, again, you know, as much as I don't think stage racing is necessary at all, I would certainly take a small victory, in my opinion, and uh, welcome at least removing the cautions. Uh, I think that would certainly uh, go a long way in improving uh, the quality of the racing and uh, the quality of the strategy as well. And, you know, certainly that's a major talking point uh, following the 500. The fact that you had A.J. Allmendinger uh, running faster by himself than the entire pack had and by no small margin at that. Um, you know, everybody's talking about, you know, what can we do to try to prevent a situation from that, like from like that from happening again here? Um, you know, I think that that's certainly an option that, that NASCAR could consider. But again, based on the track record of just the last year, I don't expect that to happen. But if they were to do it, I would certainly welcome it. And I think uh, every track would benefit from it. But particularly, I think the road courses and the super speedways would be the two that benefit from it the most. The super speedway, I think, would be a huge benefit for that Atlanta Motor Speedway. 
I was a little bit surprised. I thought we were going to see a little bit more tire wear. But when we did see the green flag pit stops in stage two, overall, I felt this is what I was anticipating. A little bit of the field drawn out, a little bit more single file. It was still pretty entertaining overall. It's just one of those deals where, as you said, everyone was just so fuel only, fuel only compared to if we knew there was no caution coming up. Maybe somebody would have taken the tires because we knew tires would be a little bit more of a factor if we had a long green flag run compared to just taking fuel because you know we're going to have a caution coming up at the end of stage two. And that caution did come at the end of stage two, but a little earlier than normal because Joey Logano, he went for an early, excuse me, a late block. And one of the big things was with that late block, Chris Buescher got into him. They got collected on the outside wall, exiting turn two. Denny Hamlin, he had an eventful day. He spun on his own. He got collected in this, got collected in another crash later in the day. But he was in this one. And Logano, who only scored nine points at the Daytona 500, another miserable day. And he had another fast car. I really thought he had something. It was really interesting, Ben, how we had the front row, which was essentially the Daytona front row, but they swapped spots. Both of them, again, not having the great results because of incidents on the track. So now, i got to ask with Logano, he got in trouble. One of the big things we saw at Daytona, Ryan Blaney, during green flag pit stops, fell behind Logano. Cindric said he was not going to help the teammates. Logano was trying to make a move for Austin Cindric at the closing stage of stage two when Austin Cindric put a big block on him that put Logano to lose the momentum fall behind, get himself in trouble. Cindric did get the stage win, but I have to ask, considering what we're seeing the last two weeks for Penske, is this just hard racing between teammates? Or do you think Team Penske might have an issue between the drivers working together? Well, normally I would say it's just hard racing, but in the case of Penske, you know, this isn't the first time that we've seen the teammates uh, come together like this. You know, obviously Joey Logano is known uh, you know, almost notorious for being a, an aggressive blocker and sometimes getting himself into these situations. Um, and I can even think back as, you know, uh, far back as two years ago when Austin Cindric ran his very first race for Penske as a full-time driver. I know he did a couple of races in that fourth uh, 33 car in 2021, but um, when he won the Daytona 500, it, one of the moves that he made was an aggressive late block on Ryan Blaney coming straight to the checkered flag here. Um, so I, I wonder if there's perhaps no love lost between those two, even though they're going to try to work together as teammates on the track and be professional and everything, you know, I, I wonder if that still plays in the back of their minds at all, uh, even though they're teammates here. So, um, you know, yeah, maybe it is something that Team Penske needs to look at and consider and maybe just sit down with all three uh, drivers at the competition meeting uh, this this week and say, like, hey, you know, let's make sure that we're uh, in a good position here and try to help each other help ourselves as we, uh, you know, try to recover from this slow, slow, slower start to the year here. Um, you know, I think that 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 could be something that goes a long way for that team. But, um, you know, again, I think normally I would, you know, just chalk it up to being hard racing and not think much of it, especially at a track like this. But, um, you know, in the case of Penske, maybe there is something a little bit deeper there. You might be onto something there, Joe. It'd be interesting what happened with Team Penske. One of the things I feel like this is a great opportunity after these two races to get the three drivers, make sure they're on the same page, working together, as you said, because we just finished. Two back-to-back races where they acted like super speedways. Atlanta, the mini super speedway, Daytona. We know that gets crazy because everybody wants to win Daytona 500 regardless of where they are and the points. It just all comes down to the race win. One of the big things, I think, for them, now that we're coming to the mile-and-a-half oval, Las Vegas, we got Phoenix, we got the regular season. Now we got to put this all behind. What happened in Daytona? What happened in Atlanta? We need to work together better. We need to make sure the three of you are not costing each other stage points, race wins. We got to get to victory lane because overall, I felt Ford, these first two races, they have been one of the fastest overall. I think they're just sort of shaking their heads now, just thinking, here we come with this fast cars, cars on the front row, cars qualifying well, and the end, Chevrolet has all the victories. As the track cooled up, we saw everybody was really getting more aggressive, including Chase Briscoe. He got himself in trouble. He had a fast car in the straightaways, but just could not hold it down the corners. He caused a crash where essentially, out of all the crashes, I feel that was the one crash where that was a driver just pushing too much, 
putting themselves in a bad spot. The wreck occurred. But one of the big things we saw, the racing, it got really aggressive, especially that four wide lap. That was something else. The three wide finish, that got a lot of people praising this race. I have to ask you, Ben, overall, were you surprised by how the Atlanta race played out? Yes, I, I was pleasantly shocked. Um, you know, I, I saw some people saying this could be the greatest race of the next gen era. Um, I think Adam might have even said that uh, in, in the chat earlier. I think he said Gen Three. I'm sure he meant uh, the Gen Seven car. But um, you know, regardless, this this was fantastic. This was a, a a great race, a great finish. I still hate that it came at the expense of what we had with the old Atlanta Motor Speedway. I I still am opposed to the principle of trying to convert a mile and a half into a mini super speedway here, but I can't hate on this. I mean, I have to give credit where it was due. This was one of the greatest finishes, at, at least in recent NASCAR memory in the history uh, of this sport here. Um, maybe you could say of all time, you know, I mean, people might bring up the, the 76 or 79 Daytona 500, but those ended up uh, with a couple of cars junked in the infield, each of them. Um, you know, this, this was clean all the way to the end there. This was absolutely fantastic. Now, I think two things can be true at the same time. We can acknowledge that this was a great race and a great finish. We also don't need to have a knee-jerk reaction of saying, let's tear down Texas because everybody hates that track and turn that into Atlanta 2.0. Let's think about tearing down a couple of other mile and a half so next time the surface stages out and we need to reconfigure them. Let's take this formula and try to replicate it everywhere else. Because if we try to rig the system so that we get this kind of racing and this kind of finish every weekend, we really don't get those kinds of finishes at at any weekend because they're not as special as they feel when they happen in the rare instances like they happen today. This was absolutely incredible though. Uh, take nothing away from that. I'm pleasantly surprised, especially based on how uh, the, to a lesser extent, the truck and certainly the uh, Xfinity races yesterday played out. And again, more on that on the encore show tomorrow. Um, af after the Xfinity race, I was so down on what to expect today. I, I just expected it to be another complete dud with a one groove uh, single file train all day and not a lot of passing, not a lot of action. Um, and you know, a, a byproduct of an aging surface, maybe not aging as well as we had hoped, but, uh, for the cup series, I got to tell you, normally I, I just feel like they should have taken the Xfinity car and made that the gen seven car because they have a really great package in the case of Atlanta motor speedway. They had the dud this week, the cup series brought an absolutely amazing package and it put on an amazing race with, like I said, arguably, maybe we'll talk about a couple of examples that might rival it here in a second, but arguably the greatest finish in the history of the cup series in recent memory this was absolutely fantastic a fantastic finish and i was surprised with how the race played out because when we had that second lap big one i was thinking oh this could be one of those races where we're going to have caution after caution after caution the drivers are driving without using their heads making moves where we're just wondering what are we doing but that wasn't the case the crashes we saw Cars were loose. Handling was the issue. We talked about that with the old Daytona 500, Daytona back in the day where handling was a big issue. It was nice to see that. I would have liked to see a little bit more tire wear become an issue. I think that could have really made things spicy, especially if you had a group of drivers taking care of their tires and gaining later on the race. Be interested to see how that happens. And then the way the race changed. From early in the day where we had more sun to the cooler, cloudy conditions, the drivers got aggressive, and they overall raced each other with respect, which I think a lot of people are always talking about. We had really just that one crash where it was a driver essentially forcing the issue a little too early. I think, honestly, if Chase Briscoe had staying in the outside line, just pushing it, he could have put himself in a much better spot. It's one of those deals where... As you mentioned, I think this was a great product, and I 100% agree with you. As much as we agree Texas could use some work, don't make Texas the next Atlanta 2.0 because this race, I think, is it's really helping Atlanta more speedway. We're seeing more fans in attendance. It's still not the same old Atlanta that the drivers love, but at the end, the fans are coming out. And once again, as you mentioned, one of the best finishes I think a lot of people are talking about for quite some time in Atlanta. The old configuration, of course, you had Dale Earnhardt, Bobby Labonte in 2000 by inches. A year later, Kevin Harvick holding off Jeff Gordon in 2001. Jimmy Johnson just getting all so close to a win, but Carl Edwards getting his first one by inches over Jimmy Johnson, all very similar fashion. 
And now that three wide finish between Dan Suarez, Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch. But we got to talk about some of the other tracks that have really close finishes, especially Talladega. They have a lot of them. 2011 when Jimmy Johnson just beat Clint Boyer by inches. Darlington 2003, Ricky Craven just by inches beating and banging with Kurt Busch to the finish line in the spring race when it was still the 400-mile race. And then, of course, Daytona, the Pepsi 400 in 2007, McMurray by inches over Kyle Busch. I have to ask, when it comes to all these close finishes, where does the finish rank today amongst the other close finishes in NASCAR? I mean, Joe, it's up there. I mean, I I think I saw a a tweet from someone uh, right before we came on the air. You know, maybe the top three would be in any order, 2011 Spring Talladega, Darlington uh, 2003 with Craven and Bush, and then uh, you throw this race in there and put any of the three in any order you like, and you can make a case for any combination of those. But, um, you know, the, the three closest finishes, the three greatest finishes, I think that might be what we have here. This is this is certainly up there uh, with those. And it was even, I, I would say, probably better than 2011 Spring Talladega because I, I still remember, I guess, being 11, almost 12 years old at the time, watching that finish. I, I still hate that Dave Blaney got spun at the end and was was up there leading all those laps of a Tommy Baldwin car. Uh, I, I kind of wish that we could go back and rerun the finish of that race with him being up there in the mix because that was a great run for him that day. But uh, that doesn't take anything away from the finish that we got being so memorable with, um, you know, the Hendrick teammates up there and the the RCR guys, Harvick pushing Boyer and uh, Mark Martin getting disconnected from Jeff Gordon there at the end, which cost them as Dale Jr. was pushing Jimmy Johnson to the finish. And then you had, I think, Carl Edwards and Greg Biffle making it four wide there at the, at the very end and maybe getting past Martin. I mean, you had eight cars all under a blanket there uh, at the end of that one. And I uh, thought that we were going to see a spread between the top three like we saw today. Again, like I mentioned, Martin and Gordon getting disconnected cost them uh, quite a bit of ground there coming to the line in that finish. But um, we we got that three wide finish today. I mean, this was absolutely sensational. And you could tell coming off of four that it was going to end like this. This was like, like I said, you know, I, I feel like a broken record repeating myself here, but you can't say it enough. This was absolutely amazing, incredible, fantastic. Throw every superlative out there. You want to stop me whenever you like. Uh, I think this is a finish that we're going to be talking about for a long, long time, and it's a finish that NASCAR really needed here uh, at the start of their season to help keep fans invested following, obviously, their biggest race of the year every day, 2500. I think the fans are tuned in for week two here. They certainly got a treat today. They got treated with a great finish. I feel I've always categorized fin- close finishes with Super Speedway, Pack Racing, and then the other tracks. I think when it comes to the Super Speedway draft tracks, Atlanta, this one, three wide, you can't beat that. It's up there with 2011. Darlington, 2003, the two cars beating and banging, coming to the line attached. That was a lot of fun. But I got to say, I think this one, as you said, in the past, we used to have Atlanta after Daytona. And if you came off a very exciting Daytona race, but then come to Atlanta and see Kevin Harvick just pull away, no caution flags. Very different product. We were talking about, I know, way a while ago about how, okay, now you're going to have two super speedway races. First time since 1998 this occurred. But I feel like the way this race worked out, it wasn't as too crazy. It was a great product. And now we're going to Las Vegas more speedway where we know this package of the mile and a half in this car. It should be some great racing. But it's not that big drop from Daytona to the old Atlanta. I think it just seems like a nice step. And I think this finish might go a long way to just keep people engaged and invested in NASCAR throughout 2024. And, of course, we'll be following NASCAR all season long right here in the grid. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Now, of course, NASCAR was not the only racing series going on, Ben. We have some racing down under for the first time in 2024, the Repco Supercar Series. Yes, thank you, Joe. The first weekend of the Repco Supercars Championship, it was a success for Triple Eight Red Bull Ample Racing. Brock Feeney and his teammate Will Brown won races one and two. Brown leads the point standings over Feeney by nine points. Chas Mostert is third in the standings after fin- finishing third and second during the weekend. So, Kobe, we'll start with you here. No other driver has two top five finishes. Could that make Mostert? the closest competition to triple eight. 
Well, Ben, based on what we saw this weekend in the Thursday Bathurst 500, it really seems like Chaz Monster might be the, the the only real threat right now to to Triple A. I know Rich, Richie Stanaway looked good. Matt, I think Matt Payne's going to have a great season as well. But it seems like Walkinshaw and Dreddy United have found something over the off season to give Chaz Monster a chance. I know last year was really frustrated because he, you know the, you know the Fords were down compared to the Chevrolets in performance, but as they did all these, you know, parody things throughout the season, it seemed like Ford was getting closer throughout the course of the season. It seemed like Ford is finally able to take the fight to to, to Chevrolet, and uh, both both manufacturers are a lot closer. And I think if Chaz Monster and Walkinshaw and Dreddy United can you know, can keep this up and do this week in and week out, if if Brock Feeney and Will Brown have a slip up, I believe he could be their he could be the closest um, threat in the championship th- th- this year, but what a weekend for Triple Eight. Getting wins for both Feeney and Brown, it seemed like Triple Eight has reestablished, reestablished themselves as the top team in supercars, but it's still early days, only one race weekend down, and we still have quite a handful to go throughout the year, guys, a long supercar season. Long supercar season, and overall, Triple Eight, like you said, Kobe, I think they're reestablished. If you're going to get the team championship or the driver championship, you got to go through them. But Chas Monster... What an effort, essentially two podium finishes. One of the big things I feel with Chas Monster is he'll have these strong races here and there, but then occasionally we'll have a race where it's like he doesn't show up or bad luck occurs. If he's going to bring the fight to AAA racing, he needs to be there week in and week out. I know we're going to have a nice long break already for them before we get to Melbourne, but that team has to be on top of the game, I feel, because AAA is going to be hard to beat. It's great that the Fords, that parity level is much better compared to what we had last year. I think that's going to be a big boost for Chas Monster. I think this could be one of his biggest seasons yet to compete with AAA cha- racing for that championship. He just needs to have good, solid, strong runs all season long because we know AAA, they're really good. Rarely do they have a bad race, but when they do have a bad race, definitely pounce on it, get there, and stay ahead. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what Chas Monster could do with Triple Eight Racing. Well, Joe, only six drivers finished in the top 10 in both of this weekend's races. Cam Waters, on the other hand, had a disappointing weekend, 22nd in race one after losing a wheel and then 16th in race two. Now, this year, there are 11 race weekends left, but of course, with uh, two races per round, 23 races remaining, Waters is 20th in the points, 192 behind. So, Joe, I'll go back to you on this one. I know it's obviously still early, but how challenging will it be for Cam Waters to gain ground on Triple Eight and all those drivers ahead of him in the points? I feel Cam Waters was probably one of the biggest letdowns of the weekend. Overall, we've always talked about Cam Waters. He could go out there. He could get the win. He could go out there, bring the fight the last couple of years to Shane Van Gisberg and to Brody Kosecki, but it just doesn't materialize. And then to lose a wheel at the track, at Mount Panorama too, that was just has to be so deflating for him and the team come away with such poor results. And now if triple eight racing, if they're going to be this strong week in a week out and making very little mistakes, he's going to have a hard rope to climb. The one benefit considering how we've had so few drivers finishing the top 10 for both race weekend, this could be a season where you have the best chance monster triple eight racing drivers and the rest if Cam Waters can make it where he just is consistently in the top five each and every race weekend, I think he could climb up the stands, but it's a long road, and I just don't think he could afford too many rough weekends the way Triple A's looking so far. Yeah, Joe, you, d- you definitely don't want to start off the championship on a hole because you have to spend the rest of your way trying to climb out of that. And, and yeah, we, we only have just two, two races this weekend. I know we're going to talk about the, the the Grand Prix race weekend c- coming up in March, you know, which has four races. So Cam Waters will have some time to gain some ground there. But I have to think that Cam Waters' performance this weekend in Supercars is one of the most disappointing because when we were doing the, the our um, Supercars pre-race show on Wednesday, on last Wednesday's episode of Grit Tonight, we, we, we were saying that Cam Waters would be one of the main contenders for the championship this year. And this will probably be one of his best chances yet to win the championship given that Shane Van Gisberg and Brody Kostecki are, you know, not, not, not on the grid this year and, and still TBA about Brody Kostecki and what's going to happen with, with his future in, in supercars. But Cam Waters, I, I really expected a lot more. I know his teammate Thomas Randall 
It didn't really have the best race one, but in the second race of the weekend, Randall bounced back. But Cam Waters, you know, didn't didn't look good at all all weekend. At the number six Monster Energy Ford Mustang was slow and and, and had problems. So he, he he just wasn't able to figure things out. So the best thing for him and Tickford to do is, you know, just be like, this is our one strike for the season that we're gonna tr we're gonna try to go the rest of the way and show what we're capable of. Because I think everybody knows that Cam what Cam Waters is capable of, and he's capable of taking the fight to Triple Eight. Brock Feeney and Will Brown and Chaz Mostert and all, and all of those drivers who are going to be up towards the front this this year in the championship. I, I think trying to climb out the hole is going to be challenging, but I think I think he can certainly do it over time. He's just going to have to hope that, you know, that the that, that AAA drivers are going to ha have some bad days along the way, and Waters will have to be very consistent during this early part of the season if, 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 he, if he wants to catch up because this first race weekend of the season is definitely not what he was hoping for. Well, Kobe, I think you alluded to it a little bit, but let's look ahead to the next race weekend. It's in Melbourne during the F1 Australian Grand Prix weekend. Four races on March 21st through 24th, so about a month off there. I suppose I should issue a correction there. I said two races per weekend. That's more of an average here. When you do the math, 23 races remaining, 11 race weekends go. Of course, some have more, some have less. But uh, Erebus Motorsports, I know you guys have been talking a lot about that team. They're not up to speed like they were last year. A lot going on in that organization right now. Kobe, do you think this month off will indicate what's going on with that team? Uh, who, who knows, Ben, but I don't mean this in a way to disrespect Todd Hazelwood and Jack LeBrock, but they are not Brody, Brody Kostecki and, and, and Will Brown. I think Brody, Brody and Will are on an entirely different level to Jack and Todd, and that's not to say that Jack and – Todd, you know, are not great race car drivers. I think they're solid race car drivers, but they're not on the same level as, as those two top drivers that Erebus had last year. And 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 there's really no telling what's going to go on with, with this Erebus motorsport team. It, I, I saw some good speed from, from Todd Hazelwood, Jack LeBrock, but given what we saw last year from Will Brown and Brody Kostecki, you know, it was always going to be hard for them to, to, to match their performance. And It'll be interesting to see if Erebus can try to rediscover, try to rediscover the same form that they had last year, and try to give Todd Hazelwood and Jack LeBrock the best chance to win races. And and speaking more on Todd Hazelwood, we don't even know if he's going to be in the car at the, at the Grand Prix race weekend at Albert Park. A lot of us assume that he's going to be in the car because you know, Bertie Bertie Kostecki when he was at an awards event in Australia, he's basically said that you know I've come to crossroads with my supercars team, referring to Erebus Motorsport, and a lot of people believe that he's not going to be back on this team. And if, and if you watch the Supercars broadcast, you see the team owner Betty Clemenko and CEO Barry Ryan did, uh, did this strange interview with Supercars. You know, when 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 Jess Yates was trying to ask them ask them questions about the situation, and the only thing that they could basically say is, you know, we respect Brody's privacy, but we can't really talk about this much more. It was just a really just a really strange interview, in my opinion. It's on the Supercar social media handle, so if you haven't seen, it, I encourage you to to go to go check it out. But 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 to answer the question that you asked, Ben, who who knows what this next month is going to hold? But I but I think a lot of people want to get a resolution so, re, sooner rather than later. But I think a lot of us really think that you know Bertie Kostecki is not going to be back in that car. He's not going to be back with that team. It's just a matter of you know when is he going to be able to return on the supercars grid? And if Brody is freed from his contract and able to race, does this mean that a current supercars team is going to boot out one of his drivers? You know, to sign Brody Kostecki. That would, I know that probably would not, you know, set a good precedent, but when you have a top driver like Brody Kostecki available and you have a driver who's not necessarily performing, like, what would you do? Would you go with a Brody Kostecki who can potentially get the most out of your car, or would you just keep riding the driver who's under, who's not delivering? I'm hopeful during this month break, essentially, we do get some clarity and answer because i feel like it could become a distraction it seemed during the race weekend we know how this event came together some people were not exactly thrilled that oh we're racing at mount panorama twice but we still had some good racing here and there but it was always lingering what's going on with brody kaseki what happened is he coming back i don't want this to become a year-long distraction i think it'll be great if this could all get resolved so that way come melbourne we're talking about the championship more what's going to happen with broker secretary hopefully by then he'll be with a team and we'll have progress as to what's going to be occurring but i feel this is starting to become a little bit of distraction and then when you have a series where you lost some of your biggest drivers shane van gisbert scott mclaughlin jamie Wincup retired 
and your defending champion is saying, I'm not racing or being kept out, I think that's a bad look. And at the end, it would be great for the sport to, okay, he's back on the track. There'll be a storyline to it, no matter what occurs. But if he's back on the track, it could just start moving the series forward rather than just in this limbo of what's going on. Because that interview, as you said, Kobe, that was one of the most strangest interviews I've seen in any motorsports where they were just asking the questions. You were just getting the same answer over and over and was not providing any clarity. I think they would have been better off declining the interview, to be honest, and just let's focus on the race rather than here we are at race weekend. And here's this interview, which really did not shed any new light. All right, we'll leave it there. First, before we get into uh, the, the final segment here, our one shining moments and everything, I do want to say thank you to everybody who's been watching our YouTube channel. Our Supercars uh, clips have been doing very well. And uh, I've got to say, looking at our analytics, I can tell a large portion of you are watching from Australia, New Zealand. Really appreciate that. So if you are watching, you're not subscribed already, you see the ticker down there at the bottom of the screen. We're very close to 1,000 subscribers. Uh, please subscribe if you aren't already. We appreciate all the support. And uh, all the love that you've shown us uh, on our Supercars coverage here throughout the start of the season. And with that being said, Kobe, let's uh, talk about our one shining moments. I think it might be unanimous based on the finish that we saw <laughs> in the Cup Series this weekend, but maybe there's something else uh, that stood out to each of us, but take it away. Yeah, yeah, Ben, I also want to say good good afternoon to all of our viewers who are, if they're watching live from Australia, New Zealand, it's currently in the afternoon there. Right now it's 127. P PM local time in Melbourne, Australia, where they're going to be racing next up at the Grand Prix race weekend. And like Ben was said, time for a great one shining moment. Please, please share down in the comments below. What's one moment from this racing weekend that stood out to you the most? Is, is it the NASCAR finish from Atlanta or was it something from the Thrifty Bathurst 500? And Ben, I'll let you kick it off to see if it's going to be unanimous. Yeah, well, of course, the obvious one is the Cup Series finish. And again, you know, like I said, sounding like a broken record here. I don't know how many times I've said it here on this show, but you, you can't say it enough. It was absolutely amazing to watch that. And again, I've, I've got to eat some crow myself, um, you know, because I certainly wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting uh, to, to be that enthralled by what we saw today based on uh, the expectations set by the previous couple of races here and certainly by the Xfinity race last night. Um, you know, we, we certainly got a treat today with this finish and really the entire race uh you know again you know regardless of your opinions on what happened with atlanta motor speedway whether or not this is the style of racing that you enjoy i i think anybody that is being honest with themselves cannot deny that this was a fantastic finish in the way that this played out we should all be happy and thankful for that and for, for daniel suarez in particular uh this is absolutely massive for him to be the one that comes out on top i mean i think any of those three uh would have had a, a strong storyline going for them but suarez in particular he needed this uh, with all the questions that have been surrounding him and his role in the team and uh, their future over at Trackhouse going forward, what that's going to look like. I think he silenced a lot of doubters today. And I think, like we talked about at the very very beginning of the show, uh, both winning this race and then hearing what Justin Marks had to say afterwards, his team owner, I think that lifts a whole world of pressure off his shoulders here going into the rest of the 2024 season. That is my one shining moment. We'll see if it's unanimous here as we head over to Joe. Pretty much, it's unanimous. That is my shining moment to finish as well. I will say this, though. If I had to do a second runner-up shining moment, Todd Gillian, great effort, led the most laps. That has to build confidence. Anytime you're a rookie, anytime you're new, it's a struggle, the learning experience. There's always going to be qu people questioning, do you really belong here? Today's race, I think he really showed he could be up there, and he has a lot to be excited about with the technical lines they have with Penske. So that would be my runner-up. But yeah, so far I would say two for two, the Atlanta finish, the signing moment. Yeah, and we're going to make it unanimous here. As, as as a famous broadcaster once said, it was one of them classic Atlanta finishes. It, it, it doesn't get better than that. And we're and this is going to be a finish, you know, that we're going to be talking about for years to come. It's, it's going to be the year 2034, and we're still going to be talking about this finish. That's how spectacular it, it, it was, and it, and it was just that type of finish, you know, to, to get you up off your seat. And a lot of the drivers said that even they were having a lot of fun with the race, and we saw to, to, today at Atlanta, and, you know, Atlanta's going to be in the playoffs. So I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people are already on the Atlanta MotorSpeedway.com trying to see if they can buy tickets to, 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 to the race later th this year. And – and for my second runner-up, instead of just saying Todd Gill, I'm going to go with Front Row Motorsports in general. 
you have been able to secure increased backing from Ford and the alliance with Team Penske. I think that's going to that's going to do a great thing for them moving forward. And I know going to going to Las Vegas Motor Speedway and we get on to some other different tracks coming out like Phoenix as well, and then and then and then Bristol. It, it's going to be interesting to see where they stack up because I know a lot of people feels like the season is you know really going to start this week in Las Vegas coming up because you have Daytona and, and Atlanta, two, two super speedway races. And then, you know, you have Las Vegas, which is a more traditional race. So I think we're going to see where front row motorsports truly stacks up. But based on all the progress we've seen from them in recent year, I think that, you know, you have to be really excited if you're Michael McDowell and Todd Gillen, especially, you know, Todd, Todd Gillen, you know, leading the most laps out of anyone today. And I think Todd Gillen has to, has to, feel, has to feel really good about his performance because you remember he was at one point he was one of the hottest young prospects in nascar a lot of people thought you know he could be a superstar someday at the cup series level then he got the Kyle Busch motorsports didn't really live up to expectations and then you know then a lot of people he just kind of fell off people's radar went to front row motorsports and he's just gradually you know worked himself back up and I, and I think based on what we saw last weekend and 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 in today's race if todd gillen can can continue to keep this up and try to match michael mcdowell on most race weekends i really think he can you know, get get a lot of other people looking at him and talking about him because today was just a great run for him and, my, and Michael McDowell getting getting the pole for the Cup race as well, showing you know that he's continuing you know the the, the hot streak that he's been on the last few years. I think if you're with Front Row Motorsport, you certainly have to be very excited about the future of the organization and what the 2024 season can bring. And and before before I hand it over to you, Joe, got some comments here in the in the chat. Uh, got one right here from Adam Lemery saying that you're one of China Mobile is Shane Van Gisberg and his old supercar team watching him compete on the phone in Atlanta. How cool. Yeah, it was really nice to see that. And, and Shane actually saw that after the race and he's and he's and he was he was just he was smile, smiling very wide and very excited to see that his old Red Bull and Pool racing team was watching his race all the way from Mount Panorama. And then and then Jono eighty two says that it was a nice result getting p3 for svg yeah I, I didn't expect to see shane van gisbergen in his second nascar expanded series race battling for the win at atlanta that was you know quite a surprise ran a masterful race and i'm sure ben's gonna talk more about that tomorrow night on grid live encore that's yeah. right sorry joe just real quick yeah. just to follow up on that obviously uh like kobe mentioned much more on uh svg tomorrow on the encore show and joe happy to have you uh filling in for brandon again who's got another week of uh basketball coverage but hopefully uh, he'll be available as we uh, continue on here at the beginning portion of uh, 2024 after this weekend. Um, and I want to echo what you said as well. Uh, thank you for mentioning Todd Gilliland because he absolutely deserves a lot of love after uh, the run that he had today. Unfortunately, didn't get the finish that he was uh, hoping for. That was indicative of how strong he was up at the front of the field leading all those laps. But uh, as great as the finish was, thank you for uh, not letting that get lost here in a shining moment. Cause that's certainly, that certainly is a shining moment as well. Todd Gilliland and the entire front row team with Michael McDowell sitting on the pole again, certainly coming into our own and proving to be really strong this year. Yeah. We're very excited overall for Encore tomorrow, more shining moments, highlights, low lights to talk about from Atlanta, Grafman truck series with Kyle Bush. He is back Austin Hill making a two in a row. And this is a very special week because we got, Formula One coming up, so Tuesday, be sure. Link in the video description for all our programs. Roundtable, prediction of the 2024 Formula One season. We're going to have everyone around the roundtable to discuss, make our predictions very similar to what we did for the Cup Series. Wednesday, grid tonight. Kobe Lambeth, Matt White, they're going to be on the air, your weekly motorsports news program with the latest headlines. Then Thursday, we'll be uploading Women in Motorsports, we talk about Haley Deegan, some of the news going on. And, of course, the following weekend, we encourage everyone to be sure to tune in for the preview of the F1 Academy's first race of the year. Once again, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers, Colin Show, Mark Robin, David, and Matthew for investing in the Grid Network. If you like everything you're watching, get some stickers, invest in the Grid Network through Patreon, link in the video description, as well as the option of one-time investment through Super Chat or buy me a coffee. Once you hit $10, we'll send you stickers. Get on the leaderboard. We're very excited for everyone that's been supporting us to the road to 1,000 subscribers. Hit the bell icon so that way you don't miss any of our programs this week and throughout 2024 and subscribe because that's the best way to show that you support the channel and share with your friends and family members that love motorsports. We love sharing our passion of motorsports with everybody. 
for Ben Schneider and Kobe Lambeth. I'm Joe San Diego. Thank you for watching today's program. We'll see you next time.